Welcome everyone. This is session number one in Aussie Live 2015. Woohoo! We have liftoff. We always get really excited as we come up to these. Our community has been in place for a couple of years now and we do a lot of our presentations in Blackboard Collaborate and have done so freely for more than two years. And we decided that Aussie Live Conference was the way to go. We hope to encompass all the different disciplines in education, so there'll be something in these for everybody. We hope that you enjoy being part of each session and feel free to move to the next one if you have time today, which will be coming to you live at 2 p.m., so one hour from now. Today I have great pleasure in introducing you to our very first presenter, Ben Newsom of Physics Education. I love the term physics and the spelling. And he's going to talk yeah. to us about his fellowship. <laughs> and I'll get him to uh, do a little more intro to himself because he knows more about it than I. But I was really intrigued when I looked at the schedule, Ben, and I, I saw some of the things that you highlighted in your uh, trip that you had which was a Winston Churchill Fellowship trip to North America. And the robotic video ref conferencing technologies in the New York Hall of Science was something that jumped out at me uh, quite loudly. So I'm really intrigued to find out more about your uh, Churchill Fellowship findings into educational video conferencing. But first, before we leap straight over to Ben, we want to do a little bit of thank you for our sponsors and supporters because without them we wouldn't be able to bring you these sessions. The Learning Revolution Project is the brainchild of Steve Hargaden and I've known Steve for many, many years and we are one of his projects, of which there are many, who are sponsored by the Learning Revolution Project and at the end of our presentations when you close out of the rooms, you'll see there's a little feedback form for you to fill in which goes back to the learning revolution. And of course, uh, we have to thank Blackboard Collaborate for the rooms and our major sponsor, of course, for, for whom I'm very grateful to all the team who provide their time and energies and support freely all the time. Our community is open all year, but we have our conference once a year. So let's move on and find out a little bit more about you. If you're able to see the little smiley faces and world objects at the bottom left of your whiteboard, you can click and drag them to the part of the world in which you are currently residing. If you are on a tablet or an iPad, that may not be possible. So continue to tell us in the text chat where you are from. This is always a good thing to do, uh, especially as we often span the globe. And I need to turn on the tools for you to do that. Thank you, Joe, for reminding me. So now you should be able to pick up the tools and spread them around. Thank you. That's more specific. I never knew where exactly you were in Thailand shambles. <laughs> And we have someone all the way over in the US. And that'll be Peggy. And Thailand and Australia. Well done. Thank you so much. Someone grabbed your smiley. Oh no. You can have another one, Peggy. <laughs> all right. I'm hoping that we're done there. So this gives Ben an idea of uh, just who he's talking to in the session today. So thanks for sharing that with us. And without further ado, I would like to invite Ben to step up to the lectern, switch on his video and introduce himself in more details and tell us more about physics education. Over to you, Ben. Hi, thanks so much. Um, and um, yeah, welcome to everyone. Yeah, we've got a few people across the globe and um, I'm kind of hoping this becomes a bit of a session which is just sort of a, a seed, so to speak, so that you can take it and use it how you will and feel free of course to get in touch uh, about further information. 
I did put a link earlier on with the um, the, the actual full fellowship report. Um, that'll also be at the end of the slides too. I've just done it as a quick shrink URL, and um, yeah, no problem at all. So. Really quickly, yeah, um, as you can read on the screen, uh, we've been doing a lot of science outreach for quite a few years now, and um, we see a lot of uh, kids a year. Uh, we, up until 2010, we did a lot of driving around in vehicles, uh, basically just visiting schools um, to do a lot of conferencing, a uh, lot of lessons, and uh, we saw these uh, video conference systems being established, and we thought, well, what are these things? So we figured, well, why not learn by just getting one? And um, so since 2010, we've been doing video conferencing all over the place. And yes, you're right, Peggy, physics. Um, I kind of like the phonetic way of spelling it. Um, a lot of English teachers inwardly shudder, but it's, um, it's a bit of fun. And um, that's the idea. We're just doing some nice outreach, and it's all good. All, all good. So I tell you what, it really shouldn't be about uh, what I do. It's really about what you're going to get out of this session. So um, really quickly. Uh, please, as you go along and you see something that's moderately interesting, please put it through the Twitter chat. That will be useful because, um, hey, there might be some stuff for other people you might know. And um, I really want to make sure, and I will slow down with our slides because I know that some people will have to wait for it to load through. I do need to acknowledge who sponsored my trip across North America. Uh, I did see 16 museums and multiple school districts and all these galleries and places. It was amazing. And it couldn't have been possible without the Churchill Trust. Uh, really quickly, it was established in 1965, basically to honour the memory of Winston Churchill. So Winston Churchill, basically to uh, say, look, if there are people who want to leave Australia or New Zealand or the UK to go and find out knowledge from outside their borders and bring it back to their nation and spread the information, uh, and it's of genuine interest to as many people as possible, they will um, take you on board. So I'll put a Twitter link on there at Churchill Trust. They uh, basically put this out between November and February every year for applications. Um, so I highly recommend you checking it out. Look up Churchill Trust on your favourite search engine and um, see if you want to get involved. Sorry guys, uh, in Arizona and uh, Thailand it, and, and so on, it's, uh, yeah, it is very much for um, the UK, Australia and New Zealand. However, the findings are meant to be they're useful for everyone and um, that's what this particular fellowship was. Right, so we've got to get into it because we only have a certain amount of time and I have a lot of stuff to get through. I've got to summarize, summarize seven weeks of traveling to multiple cities every three days. So, for those people who haven't done video conferencing before, it looks like these pictures you see there. Uh, the top left hand corner is just simply from a data projector run off a Polycom video conference system. Uh, that particular connection was done to a school in Wisconsin and as I was saying to um, Peggy, yeah, I really do do some early morning connections. I was running a human body session at that time. The middle session is kind of what you'd see with a, a middle picture there is kind of what you'd see with a very fancy looking system bolted onto a wall somewhere. In that case, I was presenting into, I think, University of Western Sydney and then connecting out to Korea for the Asian Connections Program with part of the UNE project, uh, University of New England. Uh, those are fancy systems, the sort of things you would see in major um, corporations, basically. And the bottom right are the sort of ones you might see in a lot of schools. Uh, sometimes they're put on a, uh, basically like a shopping cart or um, put onto a wall. In that case, I was running a chemistry session um, to a school, uh, actually to a library in Auburn, uh, Sydney. Uh, even, even though it's just a quick shop, I thought it might be kind of handy. See how those kids are just sitting there? Uh, that's not the point of conferencing. In fact, video conferencing um, often is accused, and I understand why, of it basically, is it just a video? Not really. Those kids actually just in front of that picture and that small little shot uh, are about to do chemistry stuff in their room. So the idea being is that they can do um, interactive experiments themselves and be guided by a remote presenter. All right, so the thing with video conferencing, there's so much stuff, especially if you haven't dealt with it before. So the next slide kind of shows you like even just a moderate slice of all the different solutions available. And uh, to be honest, it blows your mind when you first walk in. It's completely confusing and I totally get it. Um, this is a start. There are literally nearly a hundred different solutions of varying qualities. These are kind of like the main people that you see hanging around. There are all different versions of them. And um, these systems are kind of what you would see with either a formal video conference system put into a school or a library or some business to be able to communicate to people all over the globe, 
Or some of them are web conferencing technologies. I mean, one in the middle there is Skype, which a lot of people will know, but there are plenty of them. Um, Zoom, uh, Safari Montage, Blue Jeans, that type of things. There's all these different ones. And so it can be a bit confusing. So what I'd like to do is point out before we go too much further is that there is a knowledge base that you can get to. Um, I'm lucky enough to be sitting within the leadership team for this network with ISTE, the uh, International Society for Technology and Education. Um, there is an IBC network, an interactive video conferencing network, which is, well, really an idea of here's best practice and also some tips and tricks. So uh, there's all sorts of sessions that get put up there and I highly recommend you go check that out. Um, for those people, because I can see there's a few people here um, who are in Australia, this doesn't mean it has to be exclusive Australian. Of Australian. Um, one of the things that uh, occurred in about 2012 is that um, a few people in Sydney, a few museums and ourselves, realised that we needed to start sharing best practice because we were running these educational sessions to schools all over the country and there were varying degrees of quality and also varying degrees of, hey, what platform should I use? Why should I use it? How do I connect with people? And probably, why should I even bother? Uh, so Virtual Excursions Australia was set up as a non-profit network so that we could share best practice in monthly meetings. And it's been happening since 2012. Um, it's now morphed um, into something more than just Australia, yet it's an Australian title. Um, actually, you know what? You're right. I will put up my video. That will help Matt Harvey out. That will do that. So we'll get rid of the video and you can just talk to a logo. <laughs> That's fine. All right. So um, this has people from all over the globe. It's not just schools. It's not just video conference education providers from museums and galleries and things. Um, it's also all types of vendors, the people who actually have the equipment and also the calendar systems which allows you to go find something kind of cool if your, school, if your school is studying history or maybe biology of squids or whatever it is you want to do. So between, I'll go back a slide, between the interactive uh, video conferencing network at ISTE and Virtual Excursions Australia, there is a lot of um, information available and a lot of people are uh, there to help out. Um, so please use it there, it's there to help out, especially considering what can happen. Now here's the plan. We're going to be looking at all this different stuff I saw over the seven week trip and of course I can't really do it justice. So please send me some information, uh, quick questions uh, via my email address and I will help you out as quick as possible. Here we go. The start. BYOD. Bring your own device. Right, BYOD, I really want to give a heads up to Jack Matheson from uh, Minnesota Historical Society who did a brilliant presentation at ISTE 2014 in Atlanta, Georgia. He basically pointed out um, how to make, have kids bring in their iPads, their Android devices, whatever they feel like into a room and let them communicate directly to the presenters. Now, you might be wondering, well, why would you bother? Well, in any conference, there are people who want to put their hand up and in any class there's people who want to be involved. But there's always those kids that know a lot and they're scared to say so or genuinely just want to ask a question and don't want to be ridiculed. So this is what's cool about the um, BYOD and putting it to video conferencing situations. So imagine students sitting there with a tablet and a simple thing, which even like Blackboard does as well, introducing polling, live polling. So hey, who thinks A, B, C or D? Vote now. And um, the um, Poll, er Poll Everywhere is a free platform. There is a paid part you can do, but there is a free platform within it, which if you're not using something like Collaborate, you can basically run a quick poll to kids through a web link and they can give you live feedback straight away. Kind of obvious, but it do it's quite useful. The other two are really handy. Now, what I'm going to do is we'll talk about the one in the bottom left for a start. That's called Voki, V-O-K-I. Now, Voki is kind of like speaking avatars. What they've got is a whole bunch of preloaded cartoons that can move their mouths and talk to you with a certain voice. Now, what that, why would you want to use this? Well, you could have a, a avatar of Einstein basically standing in a classroom and you could ask the kids in a remote connection saying, right, oh, kids, if Einstein, what would Einstein say about his special theory of relativity? Well, the kids would then type in what they think send it to you via Twitter or via a back channel chat like in Blackboard or something like that and um, you can then choose the best answer and put it into Einstein's mouth and then Einstein speaks it back at the class. 
Now you'd be amazed how competitive that becomes because you get you type that in, you, if your one gets put into the into this uh, avatar's mouth, you win kind of thing. Very cool. Similar version for super lame in the middle. Uh, this is basically speech bubbles um, that you can overlay over the top of your own pictures. So uh, in the case of Minnesota Historical Society, he would show pictures of the 1800s, what it was like to be in North America, and he would put speech bubbles over, I don't know, um, if you're looking at um, you know, the slave trade or something, you'd have a speech bubble over a slave and a speech bubble over an overseer and be actually saying, what are these two people thinking or saying? And uh, that really becomes quite powerful. Now, of course, you need to moderate what they're thinking about. So um, just be aware that perhaps when you're doing a session like that, you might want a second person to help out. But it does allow people throughout the entire audience to communicate just like you're doing in your chat window right now, but this time you get to put out as the main content. All right, moving on. Games by video conference. Now, I love this. Uh, basically, games by video conference you could do through um, setting up as a PowerPoint presentation or a flash animation or something, and there are different ways of doing it. Now, um, top right-hand corner, let's go from there. That's Megan at the Royal Tyrell uh, Museum, the, 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 basically the Paleontology Museum in Ontario. Um, no, it's Ontario, dear, dear, Alberta. Ontario's on the other side of North America. She's in Alberta. Um, now, Megan does this awesome thing. Um, they basically, the, show, the photo doesn't show it completely, but you can see little dinosaurs of different colours with little numbers on them. Now, this particular session is called Paleo uh, Intelligence. Test your Paleo IQ. And what it's designed for is little kids, K to two kids, little, little guys. And they all get a little team and they've got to answer a question, whatever it be, like, you know, is uh, Tyrannosaurus rex a meat eater or a plant eater? Fairly straightforward. And if they get their answer right, uh, their little dinosaur moves down the hill. Now, what is that hill? It's a volcano. Now, the idea is that there's little guys there uh, running down that volcano away from, it, away from it before it erupts and off to the picnic basket just to the side of Megan there. If they get to the picnic basket, they get to eat. If they don't get to the picnic basket, well, they get to be covered in lava. <laughs> now, you can imagine it's a bit of fun, but what it is, it's, it's a driver. It's a driver of, of engagement, and it, it really, I thought it was quite neat. Now, you'll notice that she looks like a weather presenter. I'm going to talk later on about this type of thing. Um, she's sitting in, standing in front of a thing called a chroma key, also known as green screen, where basically she just doesn't wear green, and anything that's <laughs> uh, anything on this... Um, um, everything that's not everything that is green becomes the screen they share behind her. So it's kind of what you see in a weather channel, and she just presents straight in front of that, and um, it works extremely well. Now, um, top left, top left was from the Aquarium of the Pacific uh, down in Long Beach, California. Uh, in that presentation, they were doing a session called um, Fishial Pursuit. Uh, firstly, I love the um, the play on wording, so Fishial Pursuit. Uh, you know, hats off for that. Uh, what they were doing is they had a, a kind of like a game between they split the cast, half the class is team A, half the class is team B, and they were moderated by a pufferfish. And the pufferfish would ask questions, you know, uh, who lives on the coral reef, or what is the, whatever it, this pufferfish would ask, and the kids kind of acted in the game show, and it worked really well too. Now, uh, bottom left, um, that's Minnesota Zoo. Um, they run this thing called Zoo Food, Food for Thought, where it's kind of like a, a contestant game show where uh, you have to say which if on the spotlight there is a bit of meat. Now, who would eat the piece of meat? Would it be A, the lion, B, the zebra, C, the goldfish? <laughs> so, you know, something silly like that, again, for young kids, but it was allowing kids to think about predator and prey relationships and start sort of having a bit of a mess around. Now, obviously, this was a science education video conferencing um, talk, so you're going to see a lot of that going on. There's no reason why you can't have literacy elements involved. In the bottom right-hand corner, Moat Marine Laboratories in Florida uh, runs a nice, really good way of um, having kids uh, look at um, reading, really. So they'd read out a book and they go through the, the pictures and illust um, titles and all, all, the, all the text in there, and then they just bring up simple questions, just set up on it, just a, a slide share, which is well, just like this presentation now, and the kids just had to just put up their hands. Uh, what was nipper? A clumsy crab, smiley shark, fidgety fish. In this case, I think nipper was a clumsy crab. So Games by VC, it's really just up to you to um, have a play with it. How would you do it? You just need to put your computer 
and connect it onto a video conference system and say share content. If you're using a web conferencing device, you just say share content and you share the window you want to share. So you can do it and it works really neatly. Now, um, I, I, we'll get to uh, one which I got mentioned at the start is kind of something of interest. Video conferencing robots, uh, they've been around for a while, especially in hospitals, so that patients could t tour a hospital remotely before they got there. And also, their loved ones could basically walk around with them as they're doing their uh, thing. I want to just talk about three of them which are very much going on. Now, uh, the left-hand side, the one with the pointer there, that is a Vigo. Uh, Vigo kind of is, is, is oper that one, that picture was taken at the New York Hall of Science. Uh, they use Vigo as a way of bringing an extra student into a holiday program or something like that in science clubs where, you know, they want a kid to be involved and they just, they physically couldn't turn up. Um, the environment that the person controls Vigo on is not that different to what you're looking at now. Um, it's a web conferencing platform. The kids just don't download a client and they just control the robot to, to move forward, backwards, left and right and they just have a handler to let it walk through the galleries without causing any trouble. Uh, the new one, now I didn't get to see this one on my um, little adventure in, the, in North America. This is called a QB. Um, Texas is using the, it use a bit, especially in ESC 13 with Carol Teitelman. Um, I didn't get to see them, but that's the beauty about this uh, uh, Winston Churchill Fellowship is you get to meet people who tell you stuff. QBs are very cheap ways of, of setting up conferencing robots. You basically just um, put a uh, iPad straight on that and uh, uh, straight onto this little uh, device, and you've got a very cheap telepresence robot that can go around and do things. The one to the right is called a double double robotics. Double robotics are basically a segue. Um, very cool. Um, we actually had one in our office for a little while to try some things out. They have a camera that looks forwards and they have a camera that looks downwards, which allows you to not trip over stuff. And again, you just put your iPad straight onto it and control it with a device, whether it's your desktop computer, an app through um, your phone or your, uh, your, your tablet there. And um, you might be wondering, well, why would I bother? Well, um, it's quite useful. The, what uh, schools are using this for is for kids who might be on an excursion, but they still want them to, hey, can you just be in for an hour or so and do your presentation? Like they might be a sports star or something. There might be kids that are bedridden in hospital and really want to um, still be um, present in their classroom. Very useful. Now, I want you to take that another step further. Think of um, teenagers who may not want to come into school for all sorts of reasons. It could be bullying or it could even be pregnancy. There's all sorts of reasons that you could have a remote person come in. It allows you allows some more flexibility, and um, the, the yeah, it's quite a, quite quite cool. Now I might go further on. Now this is um, this particular uh, slide. It, uh, it was directed originally when I presented this for iTech um, 2014 at the Opera House because there's a whole bunch of museum types there. But I want you to think of this as if you're a school. I love this idea. Um, now the top. It, the top picture and the left-hand side are both done by the guys at Rochester Challenges Learning Centre, New York. Now, the one on the left, we'll stay that one for now. The Challenger Learning Centre, and um, I think uh, Peggy will be aware of this in, in the States, the Challenger Learning Centre is really a whole bunch of um, science centres um, for memorial of um, the Challenger disaster, the, the shuttle disaster. And part of that memorial is trying to show kids what it's like to work in, well, um, the, uh, in, spa in space, work for NASA. So here's what's really cool about what they do, and it's brilliant. Uh, one room is set up like it's a control center, like in Cape Canaveral or Houston or something, and just the room next to it is basically decked out like a spaceship. Now what's neat is that they set it up with two separate um, uh, video conference systems, so just a simple uh, link, and you'd be amazed how quickly the kids start operating like they really are several thousand kilometers away from Earth. Um, the idea being is they set them a challenge. In this case, the one I got to watch is they were landing a probe on Mars. And they were basically simulating what it would be like to be in a control center in terms of diagnostics of the robot, trying to get them to navigate their spaceship and all that sort of thing. Uh, and the kids in the spaceship were too busy doing scientific tasks and making sure they control the spaceship so they wouldn't like hit a planet or something. And it's brilliant. Now, the 
how would you do this at school? Well, all you've got to do is just cho choose one classroom to be the spaceship and the other classroom to be the control center. And I mean, you could dress it up as much as you want, but um, you could use any conferencing platform. Um, you don't have to have the fancy video conference systems. And you could simulate this environment and have a whole bunch of tasks between these two, two there. And I, th I really thought this was just stunning, a really good idea. They also did another version at the top called the Bathysphere Underwater Biological Laboratory, also known as Bubble, B-U-B-L. Uh, similar sort of deal, but this time they've got two sets of, um, um, I want to say octonauts because they've got young kids, but uh, two, uh, they have these, um, uh, the students would enter these two rooms and they're effectively simulating diving under a lake and doing some environmental studies, then reporting back to each other. And you can see them actually talking in that photo to the guys who are basically just across the corridor. Um, uh, for want of a uh, pun, it's very immersive. It worked very well. Now, the bottom right-hand corner was a version in, the, um, in Washington, actually, the International Spy Museum. Uh, they did this kind of, apart from talking about spies, and then, by the way, they are run um, by um, uh, ex-CIA, ex-KGB, ex-MI5 people, so they you know, kind of got some real deal behind them. Um, they do a simulated environment whereby you enter the Middle East on a spy mission, and they, whilst they do um, recorded script back to you as a participant, you would still find yourself talking to them, and they actually had some predictive stuff there. It was quite cool. Um, very smart. All right, so we're going to move on to the next one. Now, this, is, this has been around for a while, and different states have approached video conferencing in different ways. Now, before we get into the ins and outs and the rest, now, why would you want to put a video conference system on a cart? It's fairly obvious, really. It's just mobility. Um, top left-hand side, this is Darren at the Alaska Sea Life Center. Um, you, know, uh, you know, really cool. What they do is they bring their cart into, the, into their, uh, their galleries, and, yeah, you can face that camera to all sorts of the aquariums, show the seals, show uh, the diving birds. They also bring in a live stream from a, um, a whole bunch of stellar seals on a, on a remote island. And um, the, it allows kids to feel like they really are in the museum because unlike being in a, a dedicated video conference system, you've got basically, you know, people who have paid to walk into their uh, sea life center walking past and wondering, what is that thing? And you've got that real life feel. It feels like the sort of thing you would see with like a sports presenter on the side of side at half time during a game. And it looked really cool. Now the bottom right shows um, the New York Hall of Science doing the same thing during a light presentation. Um, again, they've got to walk around. Now the different versions. Bottom right, they run off Wi-Fi. Top left, they use a hard line.